Alrighty, um, I was kind of expecting the crowd to be no one, so this is nice. <laughs> um, and I'm also only mildly intimidated by people who know a lot more ex about accessibility being in here than <laughs> I do. Um, I'm not an expert on accessibility. I don't even play one on TV. I am just a back-end dev who got frustrated that all of the accessibility talks didn't cover anything that was relevant to me. So, um, oh, I'll get the mouse off the screen. That'd be nice. <laughs> um, alrighty, uh, I think people are slowly filtering in, but we'll call it good. Alrighty, hi, I'm Sam. I um, am a consummate professional, as you can tell. A very experienced speaker. Uh, done this all the time, completely prepared. The slides were done by at least 3 a.m. <laughs> I think. Um, I can't remember what's on them, so this is going to be a voyage of discovery for everyone. <laughs> Alrighty, let's talk about accessibility. Most of the talks that you get at conferences, most of the talks I've ever seen at conferences that talk about accessibility are talking about front-end accessibility, mostly about web development. So you get a lot of talks about how to correctly use semantic HTML, how to correctly use color contrast, um, what the ARIA properties mean, what they do, which ones you should use, all of that type of stuff. You get the occasional talk about the accessibility DOM. Um, you get talks about alternative descriptions in the images and subtitling videos, all of these things. And they're great, they're really interesting. I, I really like hearing about it. Um, I, I, you do hear about the same thing in almost every talk. <laughs> but the one thing I never hear about is the bit that actually applies to me. I'm a deeply back-end developer. Yes, I'm technically full stack because I work in PHP and working in PHP means you also work in JavaScript and you work in HTML, you work in CSS and you also have to know how servers work and you, you don't have to, but it really helps. Um, so yeah, it's, I am a deeply back-end developer and there's not been a single talk that I've seen that addresses what accessibility means in the back-end. Um, and there's a few reasons for that, I'm sure, but I'm, I'm glad to see that there's a lot of accessibility talks about the front end. There's been several this uh, conference. I've been seeing them pop up more and more. It's really good to see. Um, but as someone who cares and doesn't have to do any of that stuff most of, the, most of my day, it really, I, I don't know what I can do. So I started asking questions and went on a voyage of discovery uh, trying to figure out what accessibility meant for the back end of software. So let's just start real quickly going over the principles and designs of being inclusive, uh, cre creating inclusive designs. Uh, so I pulled these and paraphrased them from inclusivedesignprinciples.org. It's, uh, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Um, first one, provide a comparable experience. So if you are providing, this is, uh, it comes into things like providing alt tags and descriptions and all types of things um, where if one person is able to access the information, other people who don't have the same abilities should also be able to access the same information, albeit differently. So alt tags allow people who use screen readers to uh, hear what the image is about. Um, incidentally, because this is an accessibility talk, I set myself the extra challenge of making this talk as accessible as possible. Um, all of the images in here have alt tags and full descriptions and everything else. Um, I was trying to run uh, auto captioning. Um, it worked absolutely perfectly in the hotel room. But uh, yeah, demo gods. <laughs> um, it, it is also based on US English, not Australian English, so it, it, it gets a bit suspect at times. Um, <clears throat> so you've got to consider the situation. Uh, 
this is another important part of designing inclusively. You don't always know what situation people are going to be in. If you're creating a mobile app or a web page, uh, you don't know if someone's going to be using that who, who has perfect vision, but they're using it in full sun. They can't see their screen properly. You need to be able to cater for the fact that in those situations you need more color contrast, more stuff like that. So, so the idea is you don't know what situations people are going to be accessing your software, so it helps to design in such a way that things can be accessed in different situations. Um, being in a weird situation shouldn't make it so you can't access your software, can't do anything. Uh, be consistent. So this is another big one. If you set an expectation of a button that looks like a pin saves something into a spot and then somewhere else uh, you have another button that looks like a pin and it doesn't keep it on the, it doesn't keep the thing on the screen, you've betrayed the user's expectations. They, it is not being consistent with your design language, it's not being consistent with uh, something that looks like this should always act like this. Um, it's the same thing a lot of the front-end accessibility talks uh, go on about with uh, links versus buttons. Um, if it looks like a button, it should probably be a button. If it, if it is not a button and it is a link and it looks like a button, why does it look like a button? Um, you have to be careful to not surprise the user by making something not, not what it seems like elsewhere. Uh, give control, so you let people decide how to interact. Um, this is a fairly important one for uh, people with different you know, access, access tools. Um, you don't go, this is the one true way to do this particular action. Uh, you let people you know, use the tools that they have to, <laughs> to decide how they can do that. Um, if you don't want to talk just about accessibility, but you know, other nerdy programmer shit, you can have a look at the people who use Vim and NeoVim and everything else. Um, their chosen method of control is keyboard shortcuts, and if they didn't have to have a mouse ever, they'd be very happy. So if you make an interface where you have to click, you have to use a mouse, that's, that's something that you've made less accessible for a bunch of people. So yeah, let people decide how they interact with the thing. Um, once again, it's don't betray people's expectations. It, it, it all kind of fits in. Um, offer choice, so let people do something in multiple ways. That's really kind of important. If the only way to dismiss an alert is to click on it and swipe sideways, then people who have motor issues can't click and swipe. It's, it, it's pretty straightforward. You, should have an alternate way of dismissing things which doesn't involve only one particular interface, one particular way of interacting with it. And let, once again, let people choose how they interact because uh, you don't know them and basically you're saying, hey, I, I don't know what you or how you use this app, so uh, you can't, um, which is kind of terrible for everyone. Um, prioritize content, this is, once again, this is all not even back-end related, this is all just principles of accessibility. Um, make sure you're showing the important things and only the important things, don't just overwhelm people with the Amazon homepage of, hey, you wanted to look at one thing, but how's, uh, how's about 16 different, uh, you know, books and electronics from who knows where that, claim to be exactly the same as the thing that costs $500, but for some reason this one's 33 cents, and it's totally legit, sorry. Um, so yeah, you try to limit what's in front of the user to what's important to the user in that particular situation. Um, and and well, I'm, I'm aware that this is starting to feel like a lot, a lot like the other accessibility talks that everyone's probably been to. Um, We'll get past this, I, I, I promise. Um, uh, add value, so make things easier for users. Don't make things harder. Uh, it, it basically, there's a few other bits and pieces, but it all comes down to people who aren't like me may need to use this. 
um, and you shouldn't prevent people who aren't like you from using it because then, I mean, like, they can't pay you. Uh, <laughs> that, 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 it, makes, it makes life harder for other people and you're cutting out um, aspects of your system for people who may really benefit from it. Um, so yeah, how, how, let's, let's think about um, the back end. When we're talking about users and we're talking about accessibility, the, the big thing is almost all of the talks, almost all of the standards, almost everything is talking about how users interact with the front end of the application. Not all users are users of the application. Not all users are interacting solely with the front end of the application. I, as a back end developer, almost never see the front end of the application but I am using the software every day that I open and look at the source code. I am using the software every time I connect to an API. I am using the software, but I'm not considered to be a user. I'm not <coughs> included in all of the <laughs> standards who are, that, that are about how to include users. Um, <coughs> so yeah, I'm still a user. I'm still a valid person who is interacting with the software. I'm just interacting with it from you know, at the other end of the software. So consider who does use your software. You've got, uh, obviously, you've got your customers, your people who are paying you already, uh, assuming that you're writing software that people pay for. Um, they're using your software. People who you want to be customers are using your software. Uh, you're probably going to have office staff, CSRs, all of these people. They're also using the software and we can have some allowances um, for all of these situations. So you can follow uh, web contenting accessibility guidelines and authoring tool accessibility guidelines um, that can help you make something, your front end accessible, um, even your back front end, so your internal tools, you can follow these guidelines to make them accessible. Uh, you can hire uh, companies to come and do accessibility audits and. Uh, that's more than just following the guidelines. That's, these are experts who they come in and they know accessibility front and back. They can pick out the things that the guidelines don't cover. They can really go through and help you and tell you, hey, this thing is going to be, this, this aspect is going to be problematic. Um, and of course, when you're talking about your back end systems, you can always provide training. So if there are complex workflows which are not obvious, you can always train your staff on how to use them. Um, but once again, that's only some of the users of your software. External developers might have to interact with your API. Uh, but once again, they're only interacting with the API and maybe the documentation. Um, you do have documentation, right? You, you have updated it, right? It is valid. It is you know, not generated once automatically six years ago from a version that was uh, uh, about eight versions ago, because um, that's uh, MyOB, and <laughs> that, that's uh, QuickBooks, and uh, Zero has slightly better documentation, but yeah, it, it's <laughs> those are the ones that I've run into quite most recently. Um, the, the PHP SDK for, I'm pretty sure it's uh, QuickBooks, has a small documentation site dedicated to it, which was built automatically on a version of the SDK that was several versions ago, and the documentation's incomplete anyway. So the best you can do is dig through GitHub issues and try to figure out what the crap you meant to do. Um, not particularly accessible. Uh, that's, that's a real issue for developers who have to interact with their system. And I mean, like I could yell at them, but I doubt they'd li listen because their um, contact form probably doesn't work either. <laughs> uh, machines. Machines also have to interact with your software. They have to do a whole bunch of things. So if you're running CI, CD, obviously machines have to interact with your software. If you're just running a public website, Google has to interact with your software. And you know there are other search providers, but Google has to interact with your software. Um, <clears throat> you've got all sorts of other machines. Once again, you have machines talking to your APIs. You have to 
have expectations and not betray those expectations because as much as people and users are terrible, um, machines are terrible and stupid. <laughs> so um, the, the, the issue is if your API just doesn't return or it decides to change what the exception looks like or it just kind of gives you back an API which is, you know, sometimes this and sometimes that and it's not documented anywhere, uh, you're going to give developers hours, days of building data transfer objects just to kind of consume your incredibly inconsistent JSON or XML dump of crap. Um, and the other one, once again, internal developers have to access your software. They have to be able to write your code. They have to be able to interact with all your internal systems. They have to be able to understand it. And what allowances can we provide for them? And uh, no. Nah. That's the thing. Once again, there's no, there's no published standards for any of this. And, and for a certain, to a certain extent, I understand why that is. Um, it's, a, it's fundamentally a different marketplace. If you're looking at your front-end accessibility, you're working on trying to build accessibility for users who have no actual say. They have no chance to advocate for themselves, um, especially if your site is already inaccessible and they can't contact you. Um, so that's why the why WCAG and ATAG exist. It's because it's advocating for people who can't always advocate for themselves. Uh, your internal developers, they're a lot more understanding of how the systems work. So yeah, they can advocate for themselves to an extent if they're aware that that's an option and if they are even aware that they're missing out at all. So when you're talking about accessibility, you, you have to go, why, why should we as a company, why should my software care about accessibility? Because um, no one out on an our team is disabled. Uh, I, d I don't think I need to make allowances inside my code base when no one on my team is disabled. I'd know if they were disabled I, and then I'd make some allowances for them. Um, we don't have time to do any of this. We're just trying to ship. There's deadlines, there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, and this is going to mirror the front-end accessibility talks a bit still. Th these are the excuses that people give as to why they can't put effort into making things more accessible. Uh, so we don't have time, we're trying to ship. Um, disabled developers can figure out their own tools. And this is a huge one that I've encountered. Why should I make allowances in my code? I don't use a screen reader. They use screen readers. They know how to interact. It's, it's on them to figure out how to interact with... Well, shit. <laughs> I, so, so does that mean you just don't at all? Don't give a crap? Um, the next one, this will make our code base ugly. It'll make our code base ugly. Sure, people can't use our software, but at least our code's pretty. Um, and finally, the standards are really hard to follow. That's the big one that I see when you're looking at WCAG. They're, they're, and honestly, I'm, I'm in the same boat. It's confusing. There's, there's a lot in there that you have to add extra, all the extra bits of information that you need to add, which are not obvious to you because you don't access that yourself. And do you kind of start to see how that can, like, the people who access that can't access the stuff you do, and you, you start to go, it's really difficult if you don't have access. Huh. So let's, let's answer these. Um, we don't have, no one on our teams is disabled, and they won't be with that attitude. You're just going to be cutting out developers who might be fucking excellent developers, and you know, they don't, they can't, they can't, they can't access, you can't hire them. If you do, their life is going to be terrible. They'll get burned out, they'll leave, and they'll find somewhere else that, you know, gives a shit. Um, is a pro tip for, for this. If you, you know, put some effort into making your software easy to interact with, it makes people more productive. I don't, I don't know if that's common knowledge or not, but 
if you make things good, then people can use them good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Not every situation will allow you to access all of your tools. So, so once again, this is situational. Yeah, sure, you could have an IDE that has all of your accessibility tools, everything, your code highlighting. Hey, I'm, I'm not particularly disabled, but I have had to, in the last month, bring a server back up to life via an SSH client on my phone, and I had to edit files on a live server with Vim on my phone. I didn't have my IDE there. I didn't have my code completion. I didn't even have my dot files. It's <clears throat> not every situation allows you to access everything. And if your code is inaccessible, that just makes it infinitely harder when, you, when it shits on fire. Um, <laughs> I don't think I really need to add too much to that. Even the prettiest code is text. It is ugly. It is inherently ugly. Um, the the only, no, there's actually no. I can't think of an example of pretty code. It's yeah, code is code is horrifically ugly. Um, the best we can do is try to limit how ugly it is by you know kind of spacing things out properly and uh, trying to not confuse people who have to use it too much. Um, but I do have some good news. Uh, the standards are really hard to follow, but there aren't any. So you don't have to follow any standards. Um, <laughs> no, no, really, there aren't any standards. I went looking. I, I gave the first version of this talk about a year and a half ago, and it was an off-the-cuff, wrote it the night before for a meetup, and ever since then I've been looking for standards. Um, so we can have a look at what standards do exist. We've got a WCAG, that's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, so that's content on the web. It, uh, they're ex guidelines for making that content more accessible to more people. Um, you've got ATAG, which not as many people know about. This is Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines. Um, so if you are creating content, these are the guidelines for you. So if you work on, say, WordPress and you are using uh, the new block editor Gutenberg, um, you probably should have looked at ATAG before you released it. <laughs> if you're uh, building some commenting system where people can write their comments, uh, and this is one I encountered just the other day, you better make sure that your editor doesn't tab lock users. So users could focus it and they could not exit because the tab just added tab characters and shift tab added tab characters, control tab added tab characters. You get in there, you're stuck there, that's it. You hit enter and it adds enters because you don't want to disrupt the person who's writing. Without a mouse, you could not exit that field. Um, and that's, that's, that's a huge issue. Uh, IDEs, your IDEs, your... Um, VS Code, PHP Storm, or your IntelliJ ones. I, I know I keep bringing up PHP, and this is a room full of mostly C Sharp developers, and it is kind of intimidating, but also, um, at least I'm using IntelliJ. We, we have something in common there. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's, the, these are the standards that they should follow, and until very recently in the scheme of things, they didn't. Um, there was a bug issue that was raised for PHP Storm in 2015 saying, I can't use your IDE because my screen reader can't see it. it, it they just hadn't thought about it. That, that's just all it was. Um, and yeah, it, it, a tag is for all of the tools that you use to create content, not just display, but to create content. So those cover a lot of the website of content creation. And then you get to the... You get to the... Um, so the back end has... Um, I went looking, I went looking, and um, WordPress. WordPress, this 20-year-old procedural PHP mess is the 
only software project that I've encountered with a published coding standard which highlights accessibility. The only standard I found. So let's have a look at the WordPress coding standards. Um, the first one, use tabs, not spaces. There you go, holy war ended. Um, <coughs> And it's a justification, and it's a justification everyone knows and tries to blow off. Uh, variable tab width. And most people go, but why would a blind person want an eight, eight long tab width? They don't. If you're low vision, you have to pump up that, that size of your uh, code. You have to go to 16, 17, 18, 20 point. And if you have variable tab width, you can bring everything back and fit more on the screen. But if it's all spaces, those 14 spaces are pushing everything off the side. You can still see the shape of the code when you've got a tab width of one or two. But I mean, like, I'm a spaces man. I've always been a spaces man. My father was a spaces man. <laughs> My granddaddy, he, he died in the, uh, in the tab collapse of uh, 1962. No. Hey. <clears throat> I use spaces because it's what's comfortable to me, it's what I learned. Um, university, my first university course, my lecturer insisted everyone indent with exactly three spaces. He never gave a justification. The absolute best I could guess is it stopped people from copying and pasting code off the internet without at least going through and checking how far it's indented. And, and that's not to say they don't use spaces at all. Um, tabs indent code, spaces line up code once it's indented. So if you need to line up elements of an array, you can use spaces to do that and you can't use tabs to do that. Kind of makes sense, but at that point, it's increasing the readability of the block of code as a block of code, but how far in or out from the edge of the page should be variable with tabs. Um, braces used for all blocks, this is pretty straightforward. Don't have the bare if statements, which uh, just execute the next line. Definitely don't have nested bare if statements um, with else statements and absolutely no braces. It, it's pretty straightforward. All blocks of code use braces. Um, this was one of the more surprising ones. So in PHP, since PHP 5.4, I believe, there has been a second syntax for initializing arrays. And for those who aren't aware of uh, PHP arrays, um, they are the only data type you ever need. They are your hash map, they are your linked list, they are uh, your stack, they are a string if you want them to be. Um, they are objects, they, they are your data type. Um, <clears throat> so for a long time, the way to initialize array in PHP was using this function array and then passing the elements you want in the array. PHP 5.4 went, you know, that's kind of ugly. Everyone in JavaScript land is just using the square brackets. You access the elements with the square brackets. What if we just let people use the square brackets? And that's great. And the uh, WordPress coding standard says, no, you don't do that um, for various reasons. but. The main one that they highlight is when you see the word array, you know you are getting an array. When you see square brackets, you might not know what square brackets mean. Um, and I'll get more into why that is in a little bit. Uh, the other one is you use snake case instead of camel case. No camel case. Um, even if you are writing classes where it's, you should have like capitalized first letter because that's the standard for classes in most of the world, you still separate each word with an underscore. So it's still capitalized snake case. Um, and file names use kebab case. So you describe what the file is in kebab case. Um, once again, they, they have their justifications for it. I'm not sure if it makes a difference, but they have their justifications for it. Uh, and then there's a few other things. So avoid clever code, use Yoda conditions, um, and they have justifications for all of these. I probably should have included the link to the coding standards, but it, it's pretty easy to find. Um, there, there's a few that they're real questionable. They prefer string values to Boolean. So if you need to add a, send a Boolean flag to a function, don't send a Boolean flag. Uh, send a string that says the right thing. 
Um, and the reason being, when people are using the code, you don't know what true means because you can't see what the code is. But if you send a string which says, uh, I don't know, uppercase then to, to your convert string class, then yeah, it, it's pretty clear to someone reading it that you intend for the thing to be converted to uppercase instead of a Boolean to uppercase. Um, yeah, don't use short tags, that's a PHP thing. There's a format for breaking into and out of PHP, which uses less characters. It looks remarkably like how an XML document starts. It confuses people. It became an option that was used, then turned off, then defaulted, then yeah, it, it, there's history. And avoid abbreviations. So don't, so don't um, bring things down to a short name. Prefer the full name. The computer doesn't give a crap if it's 15 characters long or not. So this code, here's some sample code. And yes, I have all of this code in the description of the image for if anyone accesses the slides. Um, I'm sorry for anyone who has to, but this, this is what the coding standard, or code to the standard looks like. And it's, it's ugly. It's not how I like to format code. It doesn't look pretty. You've got all sorts of things like Yoda conditions are, uh, there's my pointer, Yoda conditions are painful. Um, but once again, they have a justification in there of you can see what's being compared first before you say what you're comparing. Uh, it's harder to accidentally delete the thing that you're trying to compare. So a lot of these things that are Boolean, um, you know, doing Boolean comparisons, they, they still want you to have the Boolean value there and compare explicitly the Boolean value so you're not accidentally deleting an exclamation point and changing the meaning of your code. Um, same for strings, whole bunch of things. It, it's, it's really split out. And I mean, like, here's the exact same code in six lines. It's um, following none of the standards. It is functionally 100% equivalent. Uh, there's a couple of you know, little bits and pieces. We'll, we'll pretend do delete is something from WordPress, so we'll keep it there. Uh, we're not gonna replace that. Um, we're not using any braces because these are all single, these are all single functions. And uh, we also have some uh, nice little right on the end here. We have some nice, uh, some nice new PHP uh, syntactic sugar where it's null coalescing. So um, <clears throat> if, if you don't get anything from Assigning, a, <laughs> assigning this variable, it'll be null, so it'll just return null, but if it's not null, it'll call the active. Yeah, so there's a few bits and pieces. It's all functionally identical code, but it's harder to understand. It's much easier to mess up, and I'm not even sure I'd say it's prettier. It's still code. So, what does this have to do with accessibility in general? Um, I cracked out a screen reader and cracked out PHP Storm and I ran both of these pieces of code through it. Just, and I'm, I don't use a screen reader normally. So this is not how a, an experienced blind developer would experience the code. But it does start giving you a kind of idea about how the two if bits of code. False equals 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 empty dollar foo. If bar equals 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 dollar action. Do action to foo. Array. Foo equals greater dollar foo. Action equals greater dollar action. Else if delete equals 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 dollar action. Dollar foo model equals <coughs> get new model from foo. Dollar foo. Blank. If false equals 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 empty dollar foo model. And and true equals 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 dollar foo model greater is active. Do delete dollar foo model. So yeah, it's a bit awkward. You've got to know what some of the things mean. The the greater than stuff like that. Um, as much as I could figure out within PHP Storm, I couldn't get the screen reader to understand the meaning of the syntax behind things. And and honestly. When I pasted it into Notepad, it sounded exactly the same. So I'm not sure that PHP Storm or IntelliJ does anything on the language level to 
give the screen reader more information about what symbols mean. Anyway, so we can then look at the other sample of code and see what the screen reader makes of that. If empty dollar foo, if dollar action equals 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 bar, bar foo, compact dollar foo, dollar action, else if dollar action equals 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 delete, if dollar foo equals foo model try from dollar foo, greater is active, do delete dollar foo. Now there's a couple of things in there. I don't know if anyone picked up on that very first line. If empty. If empty. If empty. So that, that's the thing. There's, there are reasons that I don't know if they've researched them. I don't know if they stumbled onto them. But there are reasons behind the WordPress coding standard which 100% make it more accessible. And, and once again, an experienced developer using a screen reader would probably not be letting it just read out each line. Um, if you've ever seen an experienced blind developer using a screen reader, they would be frustrated with how slow my screen reader was running. But I'm not a blind developer. Most of you, I assume, are not blind developers. But it would be about five times faster and you go, you'd hear each symbol and it'd just be the tiniest little bit of a sound and they know exactly what it is. Um, and that's just, that's the way they have to interact with code. So <clears throat> when we're talking about WordPress accessibility standards, we've got to consider, what am I doing for time? Oh, yeah, all right, I'm good. Um, WordPress accessibility standards, you've got to consider who are they supporting? WordPress is, without question, the most used piece of open source software on the internet. It is apparently, according to whichever stats you get, something along the lines of 60% of all content management systems used on the open internet, um, and it is 30-something percent of all websites is this terrible PHP application. That means it's supporting experienced developers. I know several people who work for Automatic, the company behind WordPress. Um, and they uh, come from all sorts of, they come from C Sharp backgrounds. They come from all sorts of backgrounds. They are experienced, excellent engineers, and they have to access this code. Um, new developers. So quite a lot of developers I know got their start with WordPress because you could deploy it by spending five bucks a month on hosting and having an FTP program and notepad. And they became developers because they needed to change the way something worked and they found a forum which said, post this into your functions.php and they did and it worked and then they were hooked. They became developers through that. Um, international developers, this is a huge one. WordPress is massive software. A lot of the developers who use it do not speak English. If you ever spend any time in Vado Marketplace or any of those places, most of the developers do not speak English. Uh, not as their first language anyway. So if you start using, if they start using contractions or little bits and pieces which we know what they mean, a lot of developers won't ever know what that means. So they'll, it, it's just kind of some weird junk that is said and they can't throw it, throw it through a translator and find out what it means either. Um, I felt this recently when I picked up a project that was written by a Spanish firm. Um, I have spent a lot of time learning Spanish through Google Translate just to understand what their code did. And luckily for me, very luckily for me, they followed that standard. It wasn't WordPress, but they wrote everything out in full words that I could clearly see where each word started and ended, and I could throw it into Google Translate and get a rough idea of what the code meant. Um, it also supports a lot of people who are not developers. They're, so the people who have to add something to their functions.php, and then that's it. That's, that's as far as they get. They do that. It's done the thing. They have no interest in continuing to learn how to code. They've got no interest in how to make things work. Um, they don't even have Notepad because WordPress for 
for all of its wonderful ideas, allows you to edit themes and plugins directly in WordPress itself with an editor built in, living, live editing files on the server. And yeah, that, that, it, they, uh, look, at least they now have warnings saying, hey, you probably shouldn't be doing this. We're not going to stop you, but you probably shouldn't be doing this. And in a certain way, that's accessibility. Some people might not have FTP, but they still need to make a change. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, they, they, they support people who are not developers. Um, they support your parents, probably. <laughs> My dad is 76 and he has a WordPress site and he plays around with it and makes changes. Um, my mother used to have a WordPress site. I set it up for her. She never used it. But the, the, the thing is, I used to go to a lot of WordPress meetups and a good 50 to 60% of the people there were older, developer, or older people who were not from a development background who had a web store or they wanted a blog to share stuff or they had a community thing. And they're coming to user group meetups with developers to ask questions about the best way to build something in this software that they don't fully understand. But they're engaged because they need to be and WordPress needs to support them. And uh, WordPress needs to support 12-year-old websites. And I mean this in both ways. Websites made by 12-year-olds, as well as websites which are 12 years old. <laughs> and the reason why that's the case is WordPress, the very first released, public release of WordPress was released almost 20 years ago. First official version released. Automatic still support WordPress 3.7, officially. And it was released almost 10 years ago still gets security updates, still is officially supported. WordPress 5.2, released in 2019, was the first version to drop support for PHP 5.2. PHP 5.2 went end of life 12 years ago. <laughs> Every version before that, 5.1. 5.0 was when Gutenberg came out and made everyone unhappy. And it supported PHP 5.2. You could install, you, half the plugins probably couldn't install because they didn't support it anymore. But WordPress officially supports PHP 5.2 with every version up to WordPress 5.2 from WordPress 3.7. And the only reason why WordPress 3.7 is the first version that's still, well, the oldest version that's still supported is it's the first version with the auto updater for security updates. All the previous versions didn't have that, so they couldn't support that. So they are still officially supporting code that websites, which may not have been updated in 12 years, they're running on a version of PHP that is being outdated for 12 years. It has been dead. No one should have used it for 12 years. 12 years of security, anything. No, and they're still out there. There's still websites running PHP 5.2 because the cheap web host that costs five bucks a month hasn't bothered shutting the box down. They haven't bothered updating anything. But yeah, it, WordPress supports all of this. And WordPress 6 was released a month ago. It's, a, it's the latest version. It still supports PHP 5.6. And for people who are not aware, PHP is currently just about to release version 8.2 and Version 7.4, which is the last of that series, is going to go end of life at the end of the year. They're supporting the version which is so much older than that, years, years older than that. And they, they have to because all of the people who interact with their code are not just the users, it's the people who write plugins, the re people who write themes and all of these stuff. If they just start dropping off support for stuff, all those plugins suddenly break. And then millions of users' sites no longer work. So WordPress has, for better or worse, taken it upon themselves to be accessible as much as possible, for as long as possible, for as many people as possible. And they're the only software project I've encountered that actually gives a shit about that. And to be fair, their standards are, for the most part, kind of feel like they were made up by fields and not research. Some of those standards are, you know, they seem nice, but they're not just supporting people with disabilities. They're just supporting people who 
do not understand how code works. They do not understand what syntactic sugar is because they don't understand what the long version is. So that's why you have the long array because people don't know what a square bracket is. They, they'll learn eventually once they become a developer, but if they're told put it in an array and they can't see the word array, they're not gonna know how to do it. So it may be ugly code, but it's predictably ugly. And that's, that's the core thing. They're not surprising users by being differently ugly in different ways. And they go through and they rewrite the internals of functions. But the very first function in wp includes slash functions.php is mysql date, something like that. And it has been there since version 0 0.7. The interface has not changed for 20 years. The internals of the function have the interface of that function is exactly the same as it was 20 years ago when the first version was publicly released. And it's good because people use it. Even inside, I just did a quick search inside the bare WordPress source code and there's 50 something references to this function still. And some of them are from themes. It is still used. They can't get rid of it and they can't surprise users by dropping an interface which is relied upon. They can deprecate and it takes a really long time to do that, but that, that, that's how WordPress support works. But isn't accessibility about disabilities? Um, so far I've been talking about people who aren't developers and people who are 70 years old and trying to run a website for cat, cakes for cats, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> It's not about disabilities, it's, 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 about, it's about people who need to use it and can't. Um, so let's consider what, what even is a disability. You, you know, I know, I know what a disability is, but I'm sure everyone here knows what a disability is. Uh, let's, go through, let's go through some disabilities. Big one, blindness and low vision. They are not the same. Um, a lot of people seem to think that there is only one way of being blind and you can't see anything and that's it. Uh, that's not the case. Um, blindness is a sliding scale. I had friends growing up who were legally blind and they could see shadows, more or less. Uh, and it, it, there's a whole scale. Um, low vision, if I take my glasses off, technically I'm low vision. I need to boost the size of things. Um, luckily for me, my vision can be corrected with glasses. There are some people where the best correction with glasses brings them to about where my vision is without. Um, maybe not even that good. Uh, color blindness, that's the other one that comes up pretty frequently when you're talking about color contrast. Uh, color blindness comes in many forms. I'm not gonna even attempt to pronounce any of them. Um, audio, auditory impairment, so this one comes up when you're talking about subtitles for movies and stuff like that. If you can't hear, you need another way to access content. So subtitles on videos, um, a lot of training materials these days are created in video form and not a lot of them actually have subtitles um, because that requires you know, writing a script or getting someone to do it and it really sucks for people who you know, maybe just want to watch it with the sound off because they don't want to wake up someone else in the room or they don't want to disturb everyone else in the conference room or they're you know, trying to desperately figure out how the software they're meant to be an expert in works. So, <laughs> Subtitles are important. Um, loss of limbs, uh, that's another big one that, that comes up a fair bit. Some people just don't have limbs. It's maybe they were born with it, maybe it's maybe, no, maybe they um, were in an accident. Um, some people don't have limbs and they still use computers. Um, you, you've got to consider this. If, you're, if you have a pinch to zoom and that's the only way to do stuff, how is someone using a mouth stick, which is exactly what it sounds, it is a stick they put in their mouth and they tap the, screen or the computer, how are they going to do a two-finger gesture? Are they going to grow another mouth? <coughs> it's, it's these things. It's, and, and it applies to code as well. There are certain things where you're like, oh yeah, the, uh, the best way to do this is hitting three, uh, three keys on your keyboard, but they're all, both all, uh, they're all on the other, like, opposite sides of the keyboard. And, you've got one hand and you can't, you can't do those gestures so you have to go through and remap everything in the IDE or, or maybe you just don't have, 
all, all sorts of things. There's a whole bunch of things, that loss of limbs, um, motor impairments as well. That's another huge one that people don't think too much about. Sure, someone might have a hand, but they might not have very good accuracy with it. If they have muscle weakness or they have Parkinson's or they have all sorts of things, and, and I really apologise if I am offending anyone in all of this stuff, but I'm, I'm just trying to get out there that people may not have the accuracy of motion that you believe that everyone should have. If you have a small thing to click on, some people just can't, even if they can use a mouse, they just can't. It's absolute pure luck. If you've ever tried to play a game that was built for uh, 486 on a brand new computer and it was using the CPU clock as the internal clock and you can't hit anything because everything goes by super fast, you kind of get the feeling. It, it's, you can't control the accuracy of what you're doing. Um, neurodiversity is another one which doesn't get mentioned too much, but it's also a huge one. Uh, neurodiversity is all sorts of things, who, all, all sorts of people whose brains don't work quite the same as what is considered typical. So this could be anything from ADHD, it could be autism spectrum, it could be uh, epilepsy, it could be all sorts of things. And as I start bringing those up, you go, oh yeah, that's right, you don't make flashing images because that's bad for people with epilepsy. But what you're not considering is um, people who are on the spectrum might get overwhelmed by things. They might have uh, sensory issues that you aren't considering. You know, there's all sorts of things. They, they might not like when two things are touching. It just, I, they don't know why it is. It just, it's wrong to them. And the same thing for ADHD. You, you can get completely overstimulated or understimulated, all, all sorts of stimulated, and none of it's helpful. And if you are actively contributing to that, you're making life worse for these people. Um, English as a second language, is that, that's a disability. That is a disability when it comes to code that is written primarily in English and in particular American English. Um, especially when you start using contractions and like cultural references and all sorts of things. People will learn, they have to figure it out, otherwise they can't access the code or they go screw this and write everything in their own native language and no one else accesses their code. And everyone goes, oh, well, why'd you write it in Spanish or French? I'm not Spanish. They fucking are. <laughs> so if they want to contribute to the modern world of computing, they need to learn, even if they don't learn English, they need to learn how to understand code in English. And junior developers, Junior developers, biggest disability that everyone here has run into. Everyone here has had this disability at some point in time. I still have it. Uh, no. And people go, that's not a disability. But you, what is disability quite literally means a lack of ability, less ability. They do not have the ability, they do not have the context, they do not have the understanding that senior developers have. So if they see a chunk of particularly syntax sugared out the wazoo code, making use of MapReduce, all sorts of things. They have no understanding of that and they never will. They'll just tune out, get overwhelmed and leave the industry. And you might be kicking out people who are going to be do excellent things because they don't understand your super clever code. Um, and that's not their fault, it's yours. And especially if your super clever code is not being super clever for any reason other than to show off how super and clever and smart you are, get the fuck out. <laughs> the other thing, disabilities might be temporary. Junior developers, if they get through all the shit, they get to be at least mid-level. Um, <clears throat> they'll, they'll, they'll get senior, they'll be given the title of senior, maybe CTO at their startup after two years and then they're, they're set, they're, they're right, right for fangs. Um, but yeah, disabilities might be temporary and it goes all sorts of ways. Uh, while I was doing research, I was talking to a developer I know who is deaf. He, um, as far as I'm aware, he was born deaf. He has a cochlear implant now. His disability was temporary. 
He can hear now. He couldn't when he started. So that was a temporary disability. It can go the other way. Uh, I was also speaking to another developer who was blind. He wasn't always. He started as a, develop as a sighted developer. He's blind now. He had to relearn how to develop using the tools that are built for blind developers with an understanding of what code looks like and going, this doesn't look right. It doesn't sound the way I remember it looking. And it's a, it's a temporary disability. Um, as a kid, I broke my arm several times. Every single time I had a, effectively a loss of limb, but at least a, a motor impairment. I couldn't use that arm. Now I couldn't do, I didn't have a phone because they were all on the wall and they did that. And I lived in the bush and we were the only people within a hundred, uh, yeah, I don't know, an hour and a half's drive that actually had a phone. Regardless, anything that took more than one hand, I couldn't do then. And if your IDE and your developer experience requires two hands and you break your arm on a ski trip because you're living the high life and then you just can't work until your arm heals, what? Sorry, shit. So yeah, disabilities might be temporary. It's time, oh shit, I'm almost running out. Okay, um, creating software isn't just writing code. Here's the other really important thing. It's not just writing code, it's also about the process. Um, here's a great quote from someone who I really love and respect. Um, <laughs> the least accessible part of creating code is often the process. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's a, there's a great quote. You heard it here first. <laughs> That's one of the things that I came to when I was interviewing the different, differently abled people who had to create software was the code was an issue, but they, well, that's one that they could and had to overcome. The process was one that they bloody well couldn't because that relied on other people. So the deaf developer who I was talking to, he has really, he struggled with a lot of things in the pandemic, but meetings have gotten so much better for him because he can Bluetooth directly into his cochlear implant through Zoom and he can participate in meetings. But when it was a whole bunch of people in a room, it was overwhelming. He couldn't, he couldn't join in the creation, of proce the creation process of software. And you can get this even without a hearing impairment. If you have a split dev team where you're having a big planning meeting where half the staff are in a meeting room and the other half are sitting on Zoom, and anyone who's sitting on Zoom or Google Chat or Skype for business or whatever the hell you're using, there's a lag there and they can't contribute unless someone remembers them in the room and explicitly asks them to contribute. And then the meeting's over and everyone signs off Zoom and then everyone's in the room keeps talking about the thing that they were just talking about. And by the time it comes back to the people who were remote, the decision has changed and they didn't know about it. So yeah, when we're talking about inaccessible processes, there's a few of them and they're all over the place. So here's a great example when we're um, lo looking at build status. Everyone has build status. I think some people can already see where this is going. Atlassian, I love Bamboo. I wish they didn't discontinue it. Pipeline's not my jam. Bamboo, great. I still have it running. I'm gonna keep it running until I literally can't anymore. Um, red, green build status. It's not too bad. There is worse. There is definitely worse. But the thing is, if you're relying on being able to, at a glance, go, this build was red, this build was green, my build failed or passed, people who are colorblind might not be able to do that at a glance without you know, making changes to the way their system works. Um, could be better. So this is Circle CI, I believe. Uh, I found it on GitHub. Um, they don't have the circle around it, so the only thing you see color or not is the shape and you can't easily, you, you can't misscan the shape if you're colorblind. You can still clearly see a tick and a cross. Um, back to bamboo, what the hell's an exclamation mark mean? If you're colorblind, is that a tick or is that a clock? Does that mean it's still running? Um, did any of these builds pass or fail? I don't know. Could be worse, could be a solid color with a little symbol in it. Um, because that's all you're gonna see is the big circle. You're not gonna see the shape inside it very easily. Um, and it could just be fucking terrible. And I've seen it, seen it, this exists. Um, and yeah, it's, it's absolutely terrible. 
who thought that was ever going to be usable? People who didn't give a shit. They, they only go, oh, red, green, that's good enough. Um, and I'm sure that's fine for us, and I'm sure there are probably cultures where red and green don't have that, those meanings, but no. Um, the other thing is communication and feedback strategy. Uh, <clears throat> so, so this is... Um, every, who, who's been into Wordle? Um, this is not Wordle. This is a bot on Twitter that converts your Google Calendar for the week into a Wordle score. <laughs> All the orange is meetings. How are you going to write any code if your only focus time is right at the start of the day for a couple of hours? How are you going to remember what was decided the next day when you're being booked out of meetings? Um, oh, mate, Stephen here, help me out with this one. Uh, because this happens quite a bit. No context in the initial request. Hey, got a minute. Re reply immediately. Yeah, sure, what's up? Well, almost immediately. And then several hours later, get told, no, nah, sorry, figured it out. You know, I don't know what it's about. Could have been really important. Could have come to the wrong conclusion. Um, Stand-up meetings. Putting aside for the fact how absolutely ableist they are. The, the concept of a stand-up meeting is that you stand up while you have your meeting so it makes it uncomfortable to have a long meeting. Hour and a half. I had a client who had a weekly, not daily, weekly hour and a half stand-up meeting with the CEO where he would just sit there and grill every single person on the team for 5, 10, 15 minutes about what they were working on and try to solve their problems for them. And we were all sitting down. So everyone was uncomfortable the whole time, but no one was standing up. <laughs> and, and yeah, the whole stand-up meeting, we really need to find a better name for it. Because um, if you don't, uh, you can't. But anyway, and then this, this fucking feedback loop. <laughs> this feedback loop, which exists everywhere, where you build something, you go, hey, I built this thing. I need you to test the thing. You hand it over. The thing happens. Someone measures the outcome. And then you, you go to meetings and Narnia and the heat death of the universe and sprint planning. And somewhere in there, some verification happens. And we've got to check if it aligns with the OKRs and all of that stuff. And then eventually, maybe in six to 12 months, you get feedback on whether the thing you built was the right thing. And by then, you've either moved on to another company or you've completely forgotten that the feature you built existed or it just never got merged. I've got pull requests open that have been approved by everyone who needs to approve it, and they've been sitting there for a year and a half because no one bothered to press merge because the person who was responsible for that just forgot. And now they can't merge because software's moved on. There's merge conflicts. I'm not fucking touching it again. I can't remember what I did anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to try and guess how to merge the code that I did with whatever anyone else has done in that area. Some of them may have already been done by someone else without me realizing it. So yeah, you've got to think about your communication and feedback strategies. I'm going way over time. Um, but right now, I'm going to real, real quick stay in my lane. Uh, I'm not blind apart from the glasses. Uh, I'm not deaf apart from tinnitus. Um, Last year, I was diagnosed with ADHD, which came as a huge surprise to me because I always did really well in school. Uh, I was always told, oh, he's really smart, and I just wish I could put a bomb under him. Um, I can focus on things. I can sit down for 10 hours straight and just smash out immense amounts of work. And I, and I went, there's no way I have ADHD. I'm not, look at me, I'm not, I'm not running around. I'm not hyperactive. So let's have a real, real, real quick. I'll go real quick through this because we're already cutting in, uh, cutting past. Um, let's talk about what ADHD means for me in terms of development. Time blindness is the hugest issue that I run into. It means I can't estimate things very well because my estimation on how long something will take is how long I assume it will take with my forgetting that you know, things exist and I have to talk to clients and get feedback. So I'll go, yeah, that mm, take me two hours, um, forgetting it, that I know you have to get feedback on it and that's going to be a three-week thing. And then I said two hours and now it's like six hours later and they've changed the spec six times and they still want me to build for two hours. 
Um, losing track of deadlines is a big one. If they're not on top of me, I forget that they exist. Um, I miss meetings, not super frequently. I've, I've got processes in place, but I have missed a lot of meetings in my life because there was a deadline and I just f forgot. Um, working for 14 hours straight and forgetting to eat is a huge one. Time blindness, it's, I forgot time existed and I just kept working. And then it, it's like 3 a.m. and I haven't eaten at all, all day since breakfast. And I'm really hungry, and I, but I only just sat down like half an hour ago and I just smashed this out real quick and how the fuck is it 3 a.m.? And it's time blindness. Our work-life balance, I don't have any. Um, motivation frequently strikes at 11 p.m. I don't, work on, I don't work well in the regular schedule that other people work in. Um, by the way, if you are looking at this and you haven't had an ADHD diagnosis and you're going, but this is normal, this is whatever, welcome to learning something about yourself. Maybe go see a psychologist. It's about a six-month wait now. Um, <clears throat> Object permanence is another huge one which really affects me. You lose stuff all the time. You put it down and it disappears. It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It's right where you put it, but you put it down wrong and you can't, for love nor money, recognise it as the thing that you're looking for. I put my toothpaste down upside down and I couldn't see the red Colgate and I couldn't find my toothpaste for a day. My wife found it, and it was right where I put it. It's right where I always put it, but it didn't look like my toothpaste, so I, my toothpaste didn't exist. <clears throat> and it also affects my relationships with people. Um, I, if I don't see someone, I forget they exist, and then six years goes by, and I pick up a conversation with them that I thought I was having with them yesterday, and it was six years ago. And they're not aware that I didn't... That I, they thought I'd just stop caring or they didn't like them, but I just forgot they existed. No, that, that's all it is. Um, in work terms, uh, libraries and tools that are not documented and visible, they don't exist. You can have the best processes in the world, but if it's not right in front of me and easy to access, it does not exist to me. That tool doesn't exist. Uh, my computer never gets shut down. Um, I, I was had a huge effort in the week before coming here to make sure I had no un unfinished tasks on my agenda so I could justify shutting down my computer. Because if I shut it down or it powers off, um, I've got UPSs on everything in my house, absolutely everything, because if I lose the state and then come back to it the next day, I can't remember what I was working on, I can't remember what all the things were, my computer has saved my state for me with open tabs. And one of the most frustrating things about PHP Storm um, is when you open enough tabs, it just automatically starts closing old ones that you haven't touched for a while. And I lose shit, and I can't find where it was anymore. Um, <clears throat> and if something's changed shaped or otherwise looks different than what I expect, I can't see it. We already went through that um, with the toothpaste, but the same thing happens in code. If an interface changes and it doesn't look the same anymore, I won't expect to, it to be the th thing. I can't find it. I keep looking for the old thing. And someone else is going, oh, yeah, I, I just updated. I refactored. Isn't it cool? And no. No, I don't know how to use this anymore. I don't know it exists anymore. Um, and waiting mode is the other huge one, uh, which is really into process. Um, is my best understanding of it is... There is something super important to happen later in the day. If I start anything else, my time blindness will kick in and I'll miss the important thing. So my brain will not let me start anything else. A 3 p.m. appointment is death for any work that day. I cannot do any work if I have an appointment or a meeting in the afternoon. Just, no, that's the whole day written off. Because if I start work, I will miss the appointment. I will miss the meeting because I cannot keep track of it anymore. Um, <clears throat> And it, it works like hyperfocus as well, where you know a thing's coming and you can't you can't not you can't not focus. It, it's you can't do anything until the things happened. Um, asynchronous feedback is absolutely fine, but I need to know it's asynchronous. I need to know that me sending you something isn't going to mean that uh, it means that you'll get back to me in a week and I know it's going to be in, in a week. It's not, I'll send it to you and you go, yeah, I'll check that out and then you just don't get back to me. 
because I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till you get back to me or until you tell me when to expect it. And I can't do anything else because I will lose that context. I will not know what you're talking about if I start something else and you get back to me in an hour. Um, and can I have a minute? will derail my entire day because, yeah, sure, you can have a minute. You can have all my minutes because I'm not using them anymore because I can't. I can't use them anymore. You've got all my minutes. Use something with my minutes. <laughs> um, it's not all bad. I get hyper-focus. Hyper-focus is the thing that's often called an ADHD superpower, um, an intense focus on solving a particularly challenging problem. Um, <clears throat> I can get so in the zone, you hear people talking about in the zone, and it is, it is intense. And you will not stop, you cannot stop, you cannot sleep, you cannot think, you cannot do anything until this problem is solved, and you will fucking solve it better than anyone else in the world. Um, extreme capacity for research and understanding. It can be a subject matter in anything in mere hours, just by digging through every single Wikipedia page that ever existed. Um, <clears throat> People, a lot of people talk about like the knowledge of things being a large spike for people with PhDs or a shallow thing for generalists. And I have, a, it kind of looks like a shotgun and ballistics gel. I have these tiny little spikes just fucking everywhere, really deep, but completely disconnected from everything else. So I know all sorts of things about really interesting stuff and none of the surrounding information because it wasn't important at the time but I can become a subject matter expert on a lot of things really quickly. And yeah, I can do weeks worth of regular work in a few hours when I'm properly motivated. Um, when I quit my first company, I realized I was working only on internal stuff and I needed something that I could show. So I created an open source piece of software and I'm really sorry for dragging on, I should really yeah, I, I created an open source piece of software, about two, three hundred hours of work, and I did it in a weekend. Um, so yeah, let, we'll, we'll just skip through real quick. Uh, making the software accessible for me, because I can speak to this, I can't speak to being blind or anything else. Follow established practices. If your framework has a way to do things, do it that way. Um, automate as much as possible. Don't make people have to think about doing things. Uh, be explicit about what's important. Don't, don't just give me a vague thing and then expect me to know what the important part is. Um, tell me what's important and then I'll focus on that part instead of the bit that I find important or interesting. Um, there's no small disruption, so don't just, uh, don't just have a minute uh, with me. Um, asynchronous work, absolutely great if you know it's asynchronous and you build asynchronous work patterns. Uh, predictable feedback loops, Make sure I know when I'm going to get feedback on something. Uh, keep your code solid and dry. No one likes a soggy mess. Um, <clears throat> that means don't have too much stuff doing too many things at once because it, it's hard to keep all of that context in place. Uh, and foster sharing and collaboration. You have to recognise, hey, Sam is struggling with building this. He's hyper-focusing or he's not focusing at all. Get someone else onto it. Foster that. Get someone else to help body doubling, all sorts of stuff. Um, Back-end accessibility in practice. Let's make your uh, code base more accessible, reduce complexity, easy. Everyone already says that. Keep a consistent structure, yep, do that. Uh, reduce jumpy code, that means code that goes, you, you want to do one thing and has to jump through six functions and six, six different classes and six service models and over to another completely different microservice and that talks to who knows what and you can't keep track of where this one bloody ad core goes. Um, reduce that as much as you can. Uh, discourage clever code, so don't try to be too clever, just do the thing in a way that's understandable. You don't have to reduce anything. There's almost no use case for reduce that couldn't be done with a for each. Um, pick a style guide and enforce it. Uh, so code standards, doesn't have to be WordPress standards, but pick a fucking standard, make sure it's predictable. Uh, remove in-jokes, local references, code names. I'm so sick of things being named after university that the co-founder of the company went to or some reference to someone who they didn't like because that's not accessible to me because I don't know that reference and it makes no sense and it makes perfect sense to them because it's funny, ha, 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 but it could also be really offensive to someone else or, or just make no sense and then no one understands why it's named that thing. Um, document first, so 
document-driven development, uh, documentation-driven development, write what you think it's going to do and then make it do the thing and then verify that it did the thing that your documentation says and then either fix your documentation so it documents what it does or go, hey, I, wasn't do I, I clearly didn't do the thing I was meant to do. Um, be responsible with your tool selection. That is pretty straightforward. Uh, don't dictate developer experience. So don't go, hey, in this company, we use PHP Storm and you all have to use it because some people can't or won't or don't want to. Um, and if you force them to use a tool that they can't access or is difficult for them, then they're going to have a bad time and it doesn't matter how good you think the tool is, they are not you. Um, and use tabs, not spaces. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and yeah, finally, just write better code. Oh, sorry, did you? <laughs> yeah. um, increasing accessibility in your processes, uh, reduce complexity, make food like feedback loops. Well, I covered all of this. Um, basically, don't just make everyone this guy and you'll be real happy or everyone will be happy. And I think that's it. Um, we probably don't have time for questions, so questions outside, I guess. <laughs>